Notebook 5, The Lorette Charnel House From the 2nd of June, 1915 to the 2nd of July, 1915 Part 1 Lorette Once this had been an innocent name A name that few thought about A name for a simple hill and a small chapel that rested on its top But now it had become sinister now, it was a name that evoked scenes of horror, gloomy woods, sunken roads, plateaus and ravines taken and retaken twenty times, where for months German and French cut each other's throats and massacred each other incessantly. To Barthas, that little corner of the earth was turned into a charnel house by the criminal obstinacy of their top brass carrying out useless offensives in nothing more than a cruel struggle of attrition, convinced that the Germans would be the first ones to be worn down. Their plan and their mindset could be summarized by the words of Joffre, the French commander-in-chief, who simply said, I'm nibbling at them. And so, in this nibbling, they kept throwing men at machine guns and artillery. The futile offensive at Lorette would drag on for months without ever showing anything of value for all the dead it produced. Nowadays, the Notre Dame de Lorette National Cemetery is the single largest French military cemetery in the world, holding the remains of over 40,000 soldiers that died in that battle. And this is but a fraction of the total dead. It has been estimated that as many as a hundred thousand men from both sides may have lost their lives fighting over that small hill. And so we now come to the part of Barthas' story where it would be his and his comrades' turn to be thrown into this hellish battlefield to fight and die and where they would see horrors that would stay with them for the rest of their lives. It was eight in the evening, 2nd of June, 1915. Resigned, depressed, without any enthusiasm but also without useless complaint, they left Sans and Gohel for the trenches of Lorette, which were not very far away. They walked a few kilometers and passed through the mining town of bully -Grenet. The town still had almost all of its inhabitants, and the mine was intact and still in operation. Clearly, the Germans did not want to destroy it because they expected to capture the town soon. Meanwhile, the area around the train station and the road the Poilus walked down were frequently bombarded. They walked a few hundred meters and reached the village of Ainulet. It was completely deserted, and it would also be the last vestige of civilization they saw. After this, everything would be desolation. At the entrance to the village, they followed a large communication trench which led them to a sunken road. They were to stay there in reserve for three days. The purpose of this was clear. It was to get the Poilus used to the constant roar of the cannons, the pervasive smell of rotting flesh, and the fat flies, the ticks, the worms, the rats, and everything unclean and impure that flourished in those fields of death. Along the embankment of the sunken road, French engineers had built some dugouts covered with sheets of iron. They had been meant to hold twelve men at most. Now the Poilus were packed there in groups of forty. Inside it was so crowded it was impossible to lie down. One could barely crouch with his legs curled up. If someone tried to move, one immediately heard howls of complaint from his neighbors. And if someone tried to get out of that hole, he inevitably stepped on feet, legs and knees. The air was like poison and the heat unbearable. And to make things worse, the straw that covered the floor was infested with ticks and fleas, which would climb onto the soldier's legs and move up and across their body, biting and leading to uncontrollable itching. Barthas wrote that before the war he had pitied the poor gypsies that camped in their shabby wagons outside his village. Now he would no longer feel sorry for them. 
their fate was enviable compared to what the Poilus went through. In addition to the hellish conditions in those dugouts, it was impossible to go outside in search of space and fresh air. A German artillery battery had sighted its 105mm guns right onto that road in Enfilade. If someone ventured outside, he would immediately be fired upon. And even when no one was walking outside, the Germans would fire a few shells there, just as a reminder that they were watching. During the day, one of those shells hit the entrance of a neighboring bunker, wounding five soldiers, one of them fatally. When night arrived, the German guns ceased firing, and the Poilus were put to work on different tasks. Barthas got the order to take his squad, the 13th squad, and dig some latrines along the embankment of the road. Captain Houdel personally came and told him to take this ridiculous task seriously. Barthas complained that the latrines would be filled within 48 hours due to the intense shell fire, and that the area designated to dig them was too far away from the dugouts. Soldiers would prefer to relieve themselves in a shell hole that was closer to safety. But Houdel said that the orders were serious, and that, if the latrines were not finished by the following morning, they would keep working on them in daylight. The squad knew who was behind this. Therese, the rationer, voiced it out loud. It must have been that detestable Commandant Nadal. Jordi commented, The smarter they seem, the stupider they turn out to be. The schoolteacher Mondier replied that all their bosses were being infected with stupidity, and he made it clear that he did not intend to lift a single shovelful of dirt and it turned out that they did not have much opportunity to work on those latrines anyway. Immediately after being assigned their job, a sergeant appeared and requisitioned three men from Barthes' squad to take materials up to the front line. The three men would eventually return during the next day, completely exhausted. Then Barthes had to give another man to go help a sailor in the woods who was stuck with a Gatling gun. A soldier from the squad by the name of Lapeyre volunteered for this strange task. On top of all these requisitions of their limited manpower, at midnight the squad's rationer Therese and his friend Airi had to head out to find their food for the next day. Because of all this, by the time the night had ended, the work on the latrines had not progressed much. The squad quietly slipped back into their dugout but barely an hour had passed when a sergeant appeared with orders from the captain to finish the latrines immediately. The commandant Nadal was insisting for the work to be finished. Bartha said he refused to risk human lives for such a ridiculous task, and the sergeant left fuming. Five minutes later, he returned enraged. The captain had ordered the sergeant himself to make the squad finish the latrines by sending men out in twos to work on them. The sergeant forced Barthas to pick the first two men. These were Gabriel Gilles and Louis Allard, who tried to refuse saying they were sick. But, at the threat of being sent to their cruel medical officer, they grabbed their picks and shovels and went to work on the latrines. They had barely lifted a few shovelfuls of dirt, when shells started to fall around them. They immediately dropped their tools and ran back to their shelter. The squad was not bothered with digging the latrines again. At evening, they received the sudden news that their reserve duty was being cut short. They had to head to the front to relieve some units that had been strained to their limit. Before leaving, Barthas went to shake the hand of Joseph Shams, a fellow Periaswa who was in the 22nd company. This turned out to be the last time Bartha saw him. Joseph was wounded the following day. At nine at night, they left the sunken road and its hellish dugouts for the front lines. Bartha's section was privileged. They were going up there in reserve. Immediately after departing, they found themselves in the middle of a devastated forest of cut-down, twisted and uprooted trees. The ground was a mess, and they could barely follow the trace of what looked like a communication trench. 
Suddenly, a volley of shells struck the wood. The sound was terrifying and they all dropped to the ground, trembling. The minutes stretched away eternally. Right in front of him, Barthas could hear the moans and cries of wounded men. Voices went up and down the line more than ten times, asking why they were not advancing. Eventually, they resumed their march. After advancing one hundred meters, Barthas's unit found the anxious section they were to relieve. Right when the exhausted men were leaving, shells exploded above their heads and one of them was immediately killed. Barthas' section, which had just arrived, already had six wounded. From their predecessors, they received the advice to watch carefully and to not shoot, to not even speak so they would not reveal their positions, and to hide completely during the day. There were Germans nearby on all sides, and the Poilus were completely isolated in that forest. The night was spent without incident, and, following the advice they had received, as soon as day started to break, they hid inside or behind whatever hole, shelter, or fallen tree trunk they could find. Barthas's 13th squad found two shelters that had been made with branches and planks. They were in a miserable state, but at least they kept the strong sun and the omnipresent flies away. Barthas says that that day, June 5th, was one of the bloodiest in that futile battle for Lorette. The following day, the French communique announced that they had fired 500,000 rounds that day. Barthas and all those who lived through it knew that the Germans had fired just as many in return. An incomprehensible amount of shells had been fired in 24 hours at a few square kilometers of battlefield, and Barthas was sure that at least 50,000 or 100,000 of those rounds had fallen right in the woods where they were stationed. Throughout the entire day, explosions and shrapnel filled the air. The Poilus spent the entire day flattened on the ground next to each other. Their minds strained to the absolute limit. Occasionally, they would shout from shelter to shelter, asking if anyone was hit. To Barthas, it was a miracle that in the middle of this tempest, not one of them suffered a single scratch. Barthas recalled few memories of that day. The rest was a blur. He remembered the corpse of a French soldier a few steps away from them. The dead man was lying on his back and looked as if he was sleeping. It was such a disturbing sight that despite the danger, Allard went out to throw a blanket over the body. A moment later, a shell blasted an enormous hole in the ground, exhuming a corpse and blasting it into pieces, which immediately brought thousands of ravenous flies. The flies of Lorette would stay in Barthas's memory. They reached all the way back behind the front lines, and they inspired an intense disgust in the Poilus. The flies had grown fat and numerous beyond counting by feasting on all the corpses produced by that dreadful place, and they got into everything. Canteens, mess kits, pots and pans. They constantly swarmed around the men, not caring whether they were alive or dead. At twilight the bombardment temporarily lost some of its terrifying strength. The Poilus got up in a daze and everyone started to call for their comrades. No one had seen each other since morning. They suddenly heard the voice of their young Sergeant Darles calling to them. The sergeant informed them that they had to follow him. They were rejoining the rest of the 21st Company. Under the weight of the French artillery fire, the Germans had abandoned the woods. The man who was guiding them back told them that at three in the afternoon the 21st Company had attacked the German lines at the Fond de Bouval, with Captain Houdel at their head. The Germans had been scattered and 32 prisoners had been taken. They continued their march, struggling through the broken forest, when a couple of time-fused shells burst over their heads. Sergeant Darl's arm was immediately pierced by shrapnel. Blood started to flow uncontrollably from the wound and he ran off howling, completely out of his mind. The guide was also wounded and, just like the sergeant, he took off and disappeared. 
The soldiers were left alone to find their own way through that labyrinthine web of abandoned trenches. At a point, they came across the body of a fellow from their company. Barthas later learned that he had been trampled to death by a group of terrified soldiers that were stampeding through the trench in mad panic. Eventually, at nightfall, they managed to find their company and the victorious Captain Hudel. Barthas wished to congratulate Hudel on his victory, but the captain was shocked to see them there. It turned out that he had never ordered Sergeant Darles to bring them back. Apparently, there had been a misunderstanding. Discovering this, Barthas wished to go back and rejoin his section. With the Germans leaving the woods, he hoped for a relatively calm night. But Houdel stopped them. There was a lot of work to do there at the Fond de Bouval. The captain ordered them to build a communication trench between the old trench and the one they had just captured. They had to work with picks and shovels throughout the night. The sky above them was clear and peaceful a beautiful manifestation of summer, but below, the bombardment raged throughout the night with the same ferocity as during the day. They had to flatten themselves perhaps over a hundred times when shells fell nearby. Eventually, day broke and revealed to them a field of horror. Everywhere they saw nothing more than corpses and shapeless human remains. Hordes of rats were feasting on them, while crows circled above, scared away by the shell fire. The fruits of their night of labor was a communication trench that was relatively shallow, though men could move through it without being seen if they crouched. Houdel was not very happy with the result and wished for them to deepen it, but Barthas protested that the men were already completely exhausted by what they had accomplished, and the captain did not insist. That afternoon, a terrible rumor spread throughout the trench. The 21st Company was going to attack again at 3 p.m. Captain Houdel protested energetically, saying that his men were exhausted. So, Commandant Nadol himself made his way towards the front line, with a pipe in his mouth and a walking cane in his hand. He pulled out a map and asked the captain, Where is this trench that you took yesterday? Houdel replied, it is right here. You're standing in it. The commandant squinted at the map and said, I thought you had gotten farther than that. Today you must get up there, on that crest. Let's go, Houdel. I am ordering you to do it. Here, Barthas commented, Real courage for a leader is not blindly executing every order that's given to him. It is refusing to execute an order when his conscience tells him to to save human lives from being sacrificed uselessly. In a calm but firm voice, the captain declared he would not make his men advance. He had already asked them a supreme effort the day before. Now it was the turn of another company. Then, in the middle of this confrontation, a terrible bombardment opened up and the shell fell right into the trench, wounding Captain Houdel in the shoulder and Commandant Nadeau in the thigh. A section that the Commandant had ordered to go over the top was immediately hit by machine gun fire. The few men that survived had to flatten themselves in shell holes until nightfall. While all this was happening, Barthas was about 50 meters behind in reserve. They were unaware of the unfolding drama, and Lieutenant Cole, their section chief, was preparing them for advancing and occupying the front-line trenches once the attack began. Then, they suddenly realized that one of their sergeants, Sergeant Baruto, was missing. Barthas had spotted him a while before, and so the lieutenant sent him to bring him back. Barthas found the sergeant stretched in a nest of sandbags, sleeping like a baby. He shook him awake and told him, How can you think of sleeping at a time like this? We are about to attack. We've hoisted our packs and the commandant is right here. The sergeant woke up horrified. This could easily lead him to being court-martialed and shot for hiding at the moment of attack. They were on their way back when suddenly emerged a stampede of terrified soldiers that were screaming that the Germans were upon them. The bombardment around them intensified and this only increased their terror. 
infected with the panic of these soldiers, and remembering all too well the trampled corpse of their comrade, Barthas and Sergeant Baruto ran as fast as they could, to the very limit of their strength. Then they entered the communication trench with a few dugouts on the side, and quickly took cover in one of them, saving themselves from being trampled to death. The screaming men ran towards the woods, where several were killed or wounded by shell fire. Bartha saw to his surprise that there were no Germans behind them. This had only been an episode of mindless panic, though for some of the shirkers it would end with a court-martial, and some would even be shot. Barthas and Baruto were not without worries of being accused with hiding during an attack, so they moved as fast as they could to return to their section. On the way there they met a sad sight, an unfortunate man who had gone mad and was being carried by four of his comrades. Barthas described him. Oh, those haggard eyes, that convulsed, terrified, grimacing face which had lost all human expression. What horrible scenes had those eyes seen, so that madness invaded the brain. To live in such a frightful nightmare, is that where we were all going to end up? Finally, they rejoined their comrades. They all had their bayonets fixed, but no order had reached them to move forward. As they waited, a rationer arrived bringing them drink. This distribution right before an attack seemed suspicious. The soldiers let their canteens be filled, but then a strange smell reached them. It smells like a pharmacy, said Jordi, sniffing his canteen. It's either, exclaimed a soldier called Tort. The school teacher Mondier shouted angrily, It's poison, they want to make us crazy, but for two sous worth of hooch they are not going to make a killer out of me, and he emptied his canteen on the floor. They continued to wait, and eventually a runner appeared coming from the trenches. They stopped the messenger and asked him for news of the attack, and the man told them that indeed the attack had taken place, but the commandant and the captain were wounded. At this news, Barthas immediately dropped his pack and went running to see what had happened to his friend. He passed a soldier who was supporting a wounded man, and the two of them shouted that it was madness to go to the front-line trenches. It was terrible. Before having to reach the front line, Barthas found Captain Hudel on the way to the first aid station, with the help of another man. His jacket was torn in many places, and he was bleeding from his left shoulder. The captain sketched out in a few words what had happened, and his confrontation with the commandant. Barthas offered to help him to the aid station, but Hudel said it was not necessary. The wound did not seem to be very serious. Barthas asked Hudel to come back to the 280th Regiment after he was healed. The captain promised he would do all that he could to return with his men, but in the end things would not turn out this way. Captain Hudel had done too much to anger his superiors. He had punished men for going to the Easter Mass, he had celebrated the 1st of May, and he had constantly fought against unrealistic and ridiculous orders, so he could preserve the lives of his men. Now his enemies made sure he would not return to the 280th Regiment after he recovered, instead sending him to a regiment of light infantry. Before he left, Captain Hudel paid 100 francs for an extra ration of wine for the men of his company. And so, Barthas would no longer be under the command of his friend during the war. They would end up receiving an odious new captain, Captain Crow Meireville, but we will see more of him later. Returning to the present, Barthas, sad to leave his wounded friend, continued on his way and soon reached the front-line trench so recently taken from the Germans. It was terrible. The place no longer looked like a trench at all. Daily bombardments had battered and broken it. In certain places, all traces of the trench disappeared completely. At the connection with a communication trench, Barthas was greeted by the body of some poor French soldier, 
who had been decapitated by a shell. Next to that, there was another body that had been horrifically mutilated by shellfire. A few steps to the left, Bartha saw a huge pile of corpses, almost all of them German, which had started to be buried in the very trench. At the entrance to another trench, leaned on the slope, was a young German who looked like he was asleep. Barthas described him. There was no visible wound. Death had brushed him with its wing and preserved the smile which still marked his youthful face. He could see no living soul. There were only dead around him. Barthas continued along the right side and finally found some living men. Poilus were leaning on each other in threes and fours. Their eyes spoke of unimaginable exhaustion. They seemed completely indifferent to the terrible bombardments around them. And, at this very moment, Bartha saw a new, unimaginable horror. There are no words appropriate to describe this, except the ones he used himself. But what is this? Has hell opened up under our feet? Are we right at the rim of a furious volcano? The trench is filled with flames, with sparks, with bitter smoke. The air is unbreathable. I hear hissing, crackling, and alas, yes, the cries of pain. Sergeant Vergès has scorched eyes. At my feet, two miserable creatures are rolling on the ground. Their clothes, their hands, their faces on fire like human torches. And in the trench, everything is on fire. Blankets, tent cloths, sandbags. The Germans had just fired some sort of incendiary liquid on us. What's more, a pack of signal fuses has just ignited. And that's what's causing the most noise, the most sparks, the most smoke. Barthas' senses left him, and, protecting his face with his arms, he fled as far and as fast as he could from the horrible flames. He managed to rejoin with his squad, and they later told him that his eyes stared vacantly, wildly, and he spoke incoherently. But fortunately, he managed to quickly get out of it. Barthas had just been witness to one of the first flamethrower attacks of the war. Soon after, Lieutenant Cole sent them to reinforce the front line. Barthas' squad, together with another, were sent to the area around the entrance to the communication trench. In the middle of this place sat the wounded Commandant Nadol, clearly in great pain. With the inhuman policies of the cruel chief medical officer, no stretcher bearers came to the trenches to help the wounded. As Barthas had said, a man was lucky if he had a real friend that would staunch his injury and carry him to the first aid station. But Commandant Nadol had no friends. The men detested him. A single doctor was sent due to the Commandant's rank in order to do a quick dressing. To his credit, the doctor at least took the time to check on the other wounded before he left, promising the Commandant that he would come back to get him when night fell. The day passed, and the men paid no attention to Nadol. He had no friends among them. The only one who made any effort to help him was the Sergeant Thor, a man consumed with ambition who wished to get a promotion out of this. The Sergeant took blankets from the soldiers to make the Commandant more comfortable. During one moment, Nadol fainted, and the Sergeant appropriated a flask of schnapps from Jordi. Jordi who not a week earlier the commandant had wished to throw into prison for a week for not jumping up to salute him fast enough. Besides this slimy sergeant, no one else moved a finger. Night eventually came, and with it arrived the medic and two stretcher bearers. While the commandant was being loaded, the terrified medic crouched next to Barthas. He asked with fear, What are those smaller explosions right nearby? Barthas replied, Those are grenades which the Boches are throwing at us. They're hiding in shell holes. The medic was less than reassured. The hell they are, and they're pretty dangerous, aren't they? Barthas replied calmly, 
We've had a few wounded by grenades. Reeves almost had his head taken off by one. The doctor could take no more of this. He took Gabriel Gilles from Barthes' squad to help carry the wounded commandant. Barthes instructed Gilles to take all the time he needed. All that mattered was that he got back alive. Then the medic left the trench as fast as he could. Barthas was not sure if he even waited for the stretcher bearers. Later on, this doctor would be decorated with a croix de guerre for going to the aid of a wounded officer under fire. The men who had to take that trench, and the ones who had to stay and live in it for weeks and months, got nothing. And about the commandant Nadeau, he died the following day. Good riddance, said the rationer Therese. And that was Nadot's funeral prayer. And on this note, we shall leave this first part of the fifth notebook, with the death of the hated Commandant Nadot, with the loss of their good Captain Houdel, and with a first taste of the horrors of the Lorette Charnel House, a futile battle that will continue consuming many more lives before it is over. We will continue with the story soon. Until then, I hope you have a good day, and until next time.